I'm Chris Alvarez, and welcome to Military History Inside Out, brought to you by War Scholar. We're located on the web at warscholar.org and militaryhistorypodcast.com, and on YouTube at War Scholar 1945. Thank you for listening. I'm speaking with John Bruning, author of Race of Aces, World War II's Elite Airmen and the Epic Battle to Become the Masters of the Sky. Thank you for speaking with me. Hey, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, Chris. So first, tell me, how did you get into um, studying and, and writing a book about this subject? <laughs> Man, all right. So my dad, when uh, he was about eight years old, lived on the beach in Southern California, and a an F4U Corsair crash-landed right in front of his house on the beach. And, you know, my dad was already plain crazy enough as it was, <laughs> But the minute he ended up having to host a Marine pilot who had landed in his front yard, essentially, he became a devotee of all things with propellers. And that lasted his entire life. And he got me into aviation at a very young age. Uh, I built my first model at age three. And then he kind of created a monster because I started reading the history behind the aircraft and found that very fascinating and wanted to become a um professor of military history and so I went up to the University of Oregon to study history and my dad said to me as he was leaving me in the dorms if you're going to study history you're going to starve and you can't come home <laughs> <laughs> and uh, okay. uh, I've come close a couple times but uh, we've, we've had a had a wonderful career I, I don't re regret a thing and uh, the actual derivation of race uh, goes back to grad school. It started as a grad school um, paper. Uh, Gerald Johnson, one of the five aces in the book, was from Eugene. He was a University of Oregon uh, graduate. And I wrote a, a term paper on what happened to all of his neighbors in the Whitaker neighborhood of Eugene. Mm -hmm. I tracked all of their services and, and what they did in World War II. And it was an amazing group of guys. I mean, Gerald's next door neighbor ended up becoming Holly Silesi's personal pilot after World War II of all oh, things. Wow. So uh, this really, race really represents my life's work. I've been working on this, uh, doing interviews and doing research on and off for 30 years. Mm -hmm. Now, I've started, I'm 90 pages in, the book's about almost 500 pages. It's really engaging. Um, it's hard to put down, really. Um, now, can you tell me how now it focuses on five individuals and you kind of jump back and forth between their stories, you know, more or less chronologically. Um, can you tell me your approach? How did you want to uh, structure the book and the way you told their stories? Well, the history and where they were actually helped a lot with that, because when you look at the guys who are involved in this really unusual aspect of, of Air Force history, uh, they were all in essentially two fighter groups for the majority of it. Now, Neil Kirby is the outlier. There, were, there are five in the book that I talk about. Richard Bong, who became the top base. Tommy McGuire, who became number two. Then you have Charles McDonald and Neil Kirby and Gerald Johnson. So those are the five. And then Tommy Lynch is mentioned quite a bit too because he had he had a major role uh, in, the, um, in the early months of the ace race. And they're all concentrated in either the 49th fighter group, the 475th fighter group, or in Neil, Neil Kirby's case, the 348th. And they were oftentimes flying the same missions. They all knew each other. Uh, they flew combat together. Sometimes they they s broke away from their own units and flew combat with with uh, with their buddies' units. Uh, so Neil Kirby flew with uh, Gerald Johnson on occasion, and so did Tommy McGuire. And so they all knew each other, and they were all in the same spot. So being able to uh, to structure the book around that made telling the the you know the five different narratives, the five different different storylines much easier because they intersect so much through the course of 43 to 45 when they were in action. Mm -hmm. Now, um, how would you say, so I assume there, there was a lot of material to go through. Um, how, yes. how did you sort through what, what did you want to make the, you know, obviously you want to create a good narrative that keeps people engaged. How did you ap approach that? How did you um, carve out what you didn't need and keep what you felt you did? Well, it broke my heart to have to trim, to be honest with you, Chris, because uh, 
the original draft of the manuscript I think was 180,000 words. Hmm. We cut it down to, I think, 120. So there's 80,000 words sitting on the cutting room floor for this book. And, you know, I mean, obviously that was overkill. But here's the thing. There's been so many different things written about these guys after the war. Hmm. And I, I took the approach of, I already knew that when I, I, years ago, I wrote a book called Jungle Ace, which is Gerald Johnson's biography. Um, as I started that progress a process uh with with gerald i realized that there was a lot of things that either had you know been part of the mythology that emerged from from world war ii about gerald that just wasn't right or things that had been lost in the intervening years so i really focused on trying to rehabilitate the man and and um breathe some fresh life into his story and along the way i found a lot of the story wasn't right and this was the same case with the other guys. Uh, so, so what I found was some truly fresh material. I went into archives that I don't think many people have, have gone into before. Uh, I spent 157 days on the road driving around the country in my Pontiac GTO in 2017, stopping at uh, museums, archives, memorials. I went to uh, the grave sites for uh, Tommy and Richard Bong and Paul Wurtsmith, who was the fifth fighter command commander general kenny and uh neil kirby i used the interviews that i did with dozens of guys who flew with uh these five pilots mm -hmm. uh that i had conducted in the 90s uh to fill in a lot of the stuff that the you know the official documents just can't can't give you and then found new material in the documents in just really unusual places mm -hmm. uh that kind of changed my entire view and how I originally was going to write write the book and the story of the race. Mm -hmm. So it was it was a it was a wonderful process and I came home with literally tens of thousands of pages of documents and it was totally overwhelming. Now one of the things that struck me early on was um so far is the uh sort of the personalities of at least a, a couple of the guys, they seem very driven. Like internally they're very driven. Um, so uh, almost to, uh, to a point where they're kind of maybe difficult to deal with. Uh, <laughs> yes, so, that would be Tommy McGuire. <laughs> so, but I also, I think Richard, was it Ger Gerald actually? Well, I think Gerald was a little more, you said sometimes he could be depressive and, you know, yep. sort of insecure. So, you know, it makes me wonder or ask how much are we just, um, highlighting those, but you know, in the end, they were just kind of regular guys. Or did they have? Was there something more about their personalities you found that that you could kind of guess they'd achieve what they did? I think the the most regular guy. If you were to to sit down and meet these guys in a bar, the the guy that you would think is well, you know, this this dude is just like your next door neighbor. Uh, that would be Richard Bong. Mm -hmm. Bong was so quiet and introverted. Um, on the ground that, I mean, some of his own peers would later say he was the last guy we thought would ever become an ace, let alone top ace, because he was so quiet. He was he was kind of the uh, antithetical uh, fighter pilot. You know, most of the guys are uh, flying fighters are, are generally type A, very aggressive. Um, and that that characterized uh, uh, Gerald and Tommy for sure. And uh, <laughs> The most aggressive was was Neil Kirby by by no stretch of the imagination, and then you have McDonald, uh, who was who was the family guy, the family man. He was older than everybody else. He'd gone through his wild phase. He was tempered by experience, and he had this kind of standoffish quality about him that made him sort of an enigma to his men. But he always had their backs, always took care of them to the best of his ability. So they were very, very loyal to him. They they loved him as a leader. Plus, he was extremely effective in the air. Mm -hmm. How much, uh, as far as the, you know, how much was it time and place that, that gave him the opportunity? I, I think there was a lot of that, but I, I'd like you to discuss that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, it, that was everything. If this had happened in the Aleutians, there wasn't the opportunity to, to run the scores up like they did. If this had happened in Italy or these guys were in, in the ETO, they would not have been able to do some of the uh, 
um, freelancing that they did. They wouldn't have had official license to go hunt uh, as a couple of them did. Uh, that was all very much uh, arranged by the, the chain of command. And it, it, for a couple of reasons, uh, the, the big one was uh, the biggest and most important was to improve the morale of fifth fighter command, which when general Kenny took it over in the summer of 1942, it was in a complete state of, um, well, it was almost, uh, it was on the verge of collapse. The morale uh, in the 5th Air Force was terrible. The fighter pilots weren't weren't scoring. They were getting shot down. They were flying terrible equipment. It was, it was a really grim, um, uh, grim situation. And the fighting spirit of the guys had suffered. And so the race started in part as a, as a, you know, symbolic, uh, reinvigoration of the spirit of the fifth fighter command and in a lot of ways it worked now maybe you get into this in the book later but um how much did the army start to worry as they became i assume you know their exploits are written about in the papers was there a point where the army worried hey you know we want to pull these guys out because if they get shot down that's a morale boost for the enemy oh yes oh yes that became a a big issue and in fact General Kenny, who was a 5th Air Force commander, kept going back and forth between allowing these guys to fly and cutting them loose to do so, and then telling them to cut it back and, and stop flying so many missions. And eventually he threatened to pull Neil Kirby out of uh, theater if he didn't stop flying combat missions. That happened just a few days before he, he ends up getting killed. And two of the characters in the book, in, in, in history die in the first week of March, 1944. And they withheld, Fifth Air Force w withheld revealing that to Washington for, I think it was about four or five days. I'd have to go back and check the documents. But uh, eventually what happened was uh, the, the deaths of both guys were revealed to the country on the same day, a couple hours apart. And... Uh, the news broke, and um, Hap Arnold and 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 uh, everybody over in Washington were like, "Hey, uh, why are you losing so many nationally famous pilots?" I mean, one of the ones who was killed wore the Medal of Honor, and so after that, Kenny was much more tempered in how he he tried to uh, to utilize these guys. And when uh, Richard Vaughn came back into theater. A couple months after all of that went down, uh, Kenny was just vacillating between letting him fly combat and then backing off and, and going, God, we could lose him mm -hmm. and grounding him. And then he grounded Tommy McGuire as well. And after Tommy was killed, he asked um, General Whitehead, who at that point was the head of uh, Fifth Air Force and Kenny had been promoted, uh, he asked Whitehead to pull Gerald Johnson out of combat because he wanted to save him for the post-war air force. So there was, there was that competing desire that was, that was a constant source of tension within Kenny. Uh, you know, he wanted these guys to be successful because it meant that, uh, his, his units, a land would, would increase. And also he would have political clout in Washington to get more material for his theater because there was so much reporting going on about these guys in the States. It was, you know, they ran the, the scoreboard like it was a baseball game back in the hometown papers. Mm. One of the things I was really fascinated by early on is, um, I know, I know the part in the Aleutians doesn't last too long, but, um, the Aleutians aren't often, covered you know world war ii history that's not one of the more glamorous spots but the way you wrote about it was very it really brought you into what was going on there the importance the conditions um you know the threat uh to the u.s the fears um so yeah i, I thought that was really interesting can you comment on that part of the book Sure. And I really appreciate you saying that, Chris, because that's actually my favorite part of the book. Mm -hmm. I know it's it's weird because it's the very start of the race, but you have so many different just oddball weird things happening. You know, here's Tommy McGuire showing up in Nome, Alaska, straight off a transport. And he's got his silk scarf. He's got a tailored new uh, trench coat. 
and everybody else in the squadron is living in the same clothes they flew up from San Diego, and they're freezing, they're smelly, they've got only one set of winter gear, so, and it, by this point, you know, it's, uh, the, the weather in, in Nome was terrible, it was uh, the end of summer of 44, I mean 42, uh, so he was better dressed and he was also a little bit cocky. So, uh, the guys had issues with him and then he began winning at poker and, uh, he basically cleaned everybody's clocks and ended up, a lot of the guys ended up in his debt. So he's, he's up there and no, I'm pretty much irritating everybody who's flying with him. And then as, as the squadron gets recalled, he ends up with a flight that gets caught in a snowstorm and they crash land in the snow. Uh, I think it was near McGrath, uh, uh, field, a little satellite field. And they spent the night in the snow sleeping in their cockpits as bears were running around, um, uh, stalking them. I mean, like that is just a totally bizarre situation for an american warrior you know <laughs> being stalked by bears in alaska and then of course gerald he actually goes into combat uh in the Aleutians um with the 42nd fighter squadron he got uh sent over there to to adak from his parent squadron and he flew three missions to kiska and those were those were the moments where gerald lost all of his kind of youthful boyish view of combat and he'd already seen, you know, pilots he he knew and who were friends uh, die, uh, or get severely uh, injured in crashes. Uh, but this was the first time he really went through uh, the fire of combat and then losing people in combat. And when one of his tentmates, Wilbur Major Wilbur Miller, um, went down over Kiska. Uh, it had a very, very sobering, tempering effect on on him, and that was the start, I think, of where he really grew into the leader that he became later in New Guinea. Mm -hmm. Another um, interesting part was the uh, comparison of the pl the P thirty nine, the P forty, or P thirty eight, P forty, and I, I, you do mention the P thirty nine and the issues with that. Um, how did you develop your understanding for the, that those planes and those issues? Well, I can't really take credit for that. I relied on the experts. Yeah, <laughs> um, that's fine. Not being an aviator, I, I uh, first off, I have many, many interviews that I've done over the years with the pilots who flew these aircraft. So they gave me a pretty good insight into some of their their um, eccentricities. But then Chris Fahey, who is sort of a flying historian, he he's a he's an airline pilot for you uh, for for uh delta and he has been associated with planes of fame down in chino california his entire life he started out um you know sweeping the hangar floors and now he flies their p-38 their bearcat their f4u corsair so as i went forward with this uh book and needed technical information on how you actually drop a, a drop tank in a p-38 and what are the actual steps in the cockpit you need to do to do that? Chris was an absolutely invaluable resource. And I did two weeks worth of research at Planes of Fame in 2017 because that's where the 475th uh, Fighter Group Association's archives are. So I sat copying documents behind their flyable uh, P-38, which is in a 475th Fighter Group Aces markings, PJ Dahl, who I later interviewed in Florida uh, on the uh, on the East Coast end of my cross country trip. Mm -hmm. So they uh, they were all I invaluable. I, I couldn't have done that without uh, without their insider knowledge. Now you mentioned that the Aleutian part was your favorite part of the book. Are there other sort of sections of the book that you're particularly um uh, fond of or, or really proud of apart from that one? You know, honestly, being a romantic at heart, Gerald Johnson and his relationship with his future wife, Barbara, mm -hmm. was one of my favorite aspects of the book also. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, and, and part of this is total hometown thing here, because I spent so many years living in Eugene. There's a cemetery that is smack in the middle of the University of Oregon campus. Mm -hmm. And back in the day, uh, University High School, which is now the U of O's education building, was 
on the other side of the cemetery. And Barbara, to get home, had to walk through that cemetery. And it's it's an old one. There's Civil War veterans buried there. There's Spanish-American War vets buried there. And Gerald had seen her uh, while on a hike uh, south of town one day in 1939 and was instantly smitten. And Eugene was a pretty small town, so he just started asking around and discovered that she went to University High School. So he, he literally stalked her. He hung out in front of the school after school got out, waiting to see her again for a week and never saw her until he finally worked up the courage to ask somebody, hey, where's Barbara Hall go after school? Oh, yeah, she goes out the back through the cemetery. So in a rainstorm in the fall of 1939, he goes tearing into the cemetery, and there's Barbara walking along with a red umbrella. And he just, I mean, absolutely fearlessly, in the middle of a cemetery, walks up to a complete stranger and introduces himself. And they spark immediately. They they stood and talked for a while in the rain. And then uh, she went home and he called her up and asked her out. And that was the start of a, re- a relationship and a love affair that lasted uh, the rest of Gerald's life. So you don't having having read what i've read so far you you're you're neglecting the part about the um future mother-in-law who really <laughs> who who made oh. things difficult yeah i had to be careful about writing about mrs hall when um barbara was still alive she she became a family friend and she was actually in my wedding she was part of my wedding in 1993 hmm. uh, barbara was a wonderful lady her mom despised gerald <laughs> she had many many issues with gerald and when gerald's unit was suddenly called for duty in the aleutians they were they were actually flying anti-submarine warfare missions out of san diego in p-39s so all of a sudden they're told to fly their p-39s from from southern california all the way up to alaska and uh they packed their overnight bags and left and they picked up cold weather gear in in, Calif- in Northern California, and then when Gerald uh, flew through Oregon, he buzzed his neighborhood uh, in West Eugene uh, and buzzed his family's house, and then went to Portland, landed at Portland Airport, and raced straight over to Oregon Health Sciences University, where at that point Barbara was was in nursing school, and he proposed to her, and Mrs. Hall got wind of this and got wind of the fact that Barbara had accepted. The proposal and drove through the night to convince her not to do it and gerald was always very bitter over that and so is barbara the last thing she said to her mom after she caved was if gerald dies in combat before we can get married i will never forgive you and before gerald left to continue on up to alaska in his first combat deployment she handed barbara handed gerald a ruby encrusted ring that was too small for him to wear, but he put it on his dog chains and he, he flew every one of his 262 combat missions with that little ruby ring uh, on his dog tags. Yeah. And th- though, you know, you did a good job of explaining why the, why Mrs. Hall did have her, her worries. And I think you did a good job of making her not a shrew, but rather a caring mother, even though her methods were a bit <laughs> heavy. <laughs> heavy handed. Yeah. But you know, you're right. I, I appreciate that because re- really, you know, um, Richard Bong intuited this when, when he met the love of his life, Marge on leave in 1943, he'd already seen many guys in the ninth fighter squadron go down and die and leave widows behind yeah. and he at first was very much opposed to marrying marge in fact he didn't marry her until he came back from combat and he he knew he was out of combat for good he did not want to put her through that and make her a wartime widow mm-hmm. so gerald wasn't thinking that way he just wanted a wife and a and a and a child that more than anything he wanted a family so there was there was a big difference between the two of them, but the results, unfortunately, were the same for, for both families, which ended up being devastating down the line. Hmm. Let's turn uh, to... We, we've already talked about some of the resources you used for your research. Um, I'd like to explore that a little more. So you mentioned the interviews and stuff. Can you go into more detail on um, maybe some of the archives you used and, and who you spoke to and that sort of thing? Sure. Uh, back in, in the 90s, who I interviewed uh, was pretty much every single member 
of the 49th fighter group that I could find who was still alive. And keep in mind, this is kind of the, the, the era pre, you know, all the different ways you can find people online. So, uh, I was hunting through the association. I had a, you know, uh, letters that went into the fighter group associations, uh, newsletter and people would contact me that way and then give me the names of guys they flew with who'd be willing to talk to me. And pretty much everybody was, there was only, uh, one pilot who, for some reason decided he didn't want to talk to me. And that was Jim Watkins, which really bummed me out because he and Gerald were very good friends. But, uh, that, that was the start of the oral history that I did. And then I was, uh, uh, I consulted for a documentary company that sent me all over the country and Canada doing interviews with aviators for different documentary projects. Uh, that was from about 2004. And a lot of the guys, uh, that we ended up interviewing were also New Guinea vets. And knew knew Gerald, knew uh, Dick Bong, knew Tommy McGuire, and they shared with us uh, some remarkable insight and, and just amazing stories. Mm-hmm. So that was sort of the, the the first layer of of research that I did, along with the unit histories and the, the you know the basic stuff that you can get out of the um, out of Maxwell at the uh, United States Air Force Research Agency archives. Mm-hmm. Um, in 2017, what I wanted to do was hit places that I didn't think anybody else had gotten into. So I had some material from the Hoover Institute that was that was useful. That's on the Stanford campus that I collected over the years. And then I went up to the Seattle Museum of Flight and got into the Fighter Races Association archives. And then two weeks at, uh, at Chino and the 475th archives, um, I went to the Bong Memorial um, in Superior, uh, Wisconsin, and dug around in their material for another two weeks, I think. Along the way, uh, the, the P-40 Warhawk Museum in Nampa, Idaho, has an absolutely remarkable collection of, of transcripts of oral history. And if anybody is doing research on World War II and needs something from somebody who actually witnessed uh, the events unfolding during World War II that you, you know the United States was involved with, Nampa has at least one vet, I can guarantee it. And the most important uh, oral history that I found there was uh, Shady Lane. Shady Lane's uh, uh, memoirs and his letters are there also uh, in the in the transcripts that they've got. And he was one of the early 39th Fighter Squadron pilots who flew with Bong right during the introduction of the P-38 to combat. And then I went to the uh, National Personnel Records Center in St. Louis. And most people dig around there for the personnel files, which, you know, in a lot of cases were destroyed. And in the case of most of these guys, uh, there wasn't much left uh, as a result of the fire that happened in the 70s. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there are the squadron and unit dailies there and the Form 5s, which are uh, the Form 5s were the um, uh, archived U.S. Army Air Force records of everybody's flights. So it's basically a copy of the personal flight logs the pilots kept. And that turned out to be incredibly useful. I went through and every single pilot that, uh, well, not just the guys, the the five that, that I write about, but also the people who were involved in some of the biggest fights with these guys, I got their Form 5s and copied everything hmm. uh, and uh, and got all of their flight records. So I could see as I laid everything out who was flying with who on any given day. And then the mission reports um, from the National Archives, uh, oh, the dailies were also really important too because those show the squadron strength at any given point mm-hmm. and then who's coming and going and who's assigned where. And that became really important with Tommy Lynch and Neil Kirby. When you get to that section of the book, I, I think it's you know for, for people who know the history, they're going to be most surprised at that because Tommy Lynch was one of the ranking aces at the end of 43 and every single secondary source says that he did not get back into theater until January or February 44, but he actually got back at the end of November and went back to his unit and was learning to fly the new aircraft that they had, which was a P 47. And all of a sudden he gets pulled out of combat or out of the, out of the unit and that he had commanded, by the way, before he went on leave, and gets sent down for two months to Australia, running errands uh, around Eagle Farm. Mm. 
Hmm. Well, that I was able to document. I had no idea that happened, and I documented it through the Form 5s and through the dailies because you could see exactly when Tommy uh, 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 Tommy Lynch ended up in what unit where. And really what it came down to was the acting commander of the 5th Air Force at the time was Neil Kirby. Hmm. <laughs> And he was sidelining the competition. Uh, hmm. that's, that's pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah, that's so politics. that's that's how I unraveled that. Uh, and then I went to the National Archives. I went to the Air Force Museum. I saw the Medals of Honor for each of the guys that are at the Air Force Museum. There are three out of the five received Medals of Honor. Hmm. And uh, I, I gathered some material on a previous trip to the MacArthur Memorial and then lots and lots of material at uh, the Air Force Archives. Hmm. Did you um did you need did you consult with or need to consult with stuff from any other countries or was everything in the U.S. that you needed? Everything was in the U.S. except uh, the 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 real incredible experts on the Fifth Air Force are Australian. The, there are some Australian historians are who are just amazing, and I know I'm going to butcher his name, but Michael Claringborn hmm. uh, or Board. I just butchered his name. Uh, anyway, Michael is a remarkable historian, and he has access to Japanese records that I couldn't even hope to uh, to ever see. They are incredible, and uh, and apparently they survived the war intact. And the Japanese turned out to be very meticulous record keepers. So uh, I I asked him for some help on certain sections of the book, including. Uh, the day that Neil Kirby went down and had him uh, uh, review what I was uh, uh, the, the characterization that I made of of that day uh, for for Neil and uh, there there are a number of Japanese historians and uh, and an American historian named Dan Ford who who also have published a remarkable amount of information on the Japanese side. And so when you get into the first fights, especially that the 39th went into with with uh, Richard Bong, they were up against, as I was kind of uh, pu putting all of these pieces together, um, they were up against some of the best Japanese Army Air Force units of the war. There were guys in, in the 11th Sentai who were aces from the 1939 border war with the Russians in Noman Han. Hmm. And... They were exceptional pilots and high time. They had been flying for thousands of hours. And that's what these young Americans in aircraft that were uh, very imperfect technology, very uh, uh, really prematurely committed to combat. That's who those Americans were facing. Hmm. Wow. Makes their achievements even that much more impressive. Yeah, honestly, Chris, there's a there's a big controversy that raise, rages in historian and aviation buff circles about the Germans being better pilots than the Japanese and they were much better comp uh, much much more difficult competition and adversaries over in Europe and I do believe there's some truth in that because the aircraft technology was a closer match by 1944 the Japanese aircraft were generally pretty obsolete they didn't have um, high octane aviation fuel that could m get the most performance out of their engines and uh, and their their pilot quality was declining for sure, uh, but early in forty two forty three, uh, I would say the Japanese pilots were the equal of anybody in the world. They were outstanding. They were um, you know tempered through the fires of China and the early invasions of uh, Malaya and and uh, the Dutch East Indies, and, uh, and and they were outstanding with the aircraft that they did have. Mm -hmm. So uh, I kind of lean towards uh, the the argument that they really were um, the equal of the Germans, especially at that point in the war. Mm -hmm. Later on, yeah, they were they were running out of guys and they were throwing very green pilots into the cockpit. But there were still the, the aces. There were still some left. There were still great pilots uh, flying as late as 44 and 45, which actually came to uh, um, really bite Tommy McGuire in his last fight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and green or not, you know, air to air combat is not as easy, no matter what the quality of your opponent. You know, if they're out there flying and firing, so. Oh yeah, absolutely. What part of the research 
did you find most enjoyable? Well, I'd never done research under the tail boom of a P-38. So I have to say, working in the 475th Association Archives, I'm, I'm now part of the board uh, over there with the 475th, great people. But the hangar where the P-38 is in is in, like, the, my my childhood Graceland. It's the Plains of Fame was where my dad used to take me every year. It was our father-son trip. And so every day I'd break for lunch. I'd leave my copy stand and my scanner and my computer, and I would just walk into the museum and wander around and see the guys working on, you know, the latest restorations. And, you know, there's just legendary people uh, who are there at Plains of Fame. I mean, this is this was ground zero to the whole birth of the Warbirds movement hmm. back in the day when Ed Maloney was a 17-year-old kid buying top secret captured Japanese aircraft, war surplus, and sticking them in his parents' backyard shed. You know? <laughs> that's, a, that's the whole derivation of, of the, the museum. Hmm. So it was great. They have 150 aircraft there, and Yanks Museum is right next to them, and they've got another 200, I think. And uh, if somebody was always flying, so it would be a P-51 flying overhead or a Corsair or something was always in the air. It was, it was epic. Wow, that's pretty awesome. Um, what did you find in your research for this that was most surprising to you? Oh, okay. Yeah, that the, my whole original outline for this book conformed to what most of the secondary sources have characterized the race as, which is this was all driven by Kenny, the commander of the Fifth Air Force, and his personal need to uh, have the top ace under his command so that he could claim that crown. It was like a prestige thing to him. So I went into this project thinking that. And as I got into it, I realized that, yeah, okay, the start of the, the whole race was, you know, just a morale-boosting bet over, you know, the first person to beat Eddie Rickenbacker's World War One score from – uh, of 26 mm -hmm. would get a, a case of, uh, of liquor. You know, it was, it was a friendly competition. When Neil Kirby shows up in theater, the first thing he asked Kenny was, who are the high scorers? Who do I need to beat? And his entire life goal was to become the top American fighter ace. And he was totally obsessed with that goal. He was an incredible combat leader. His men worshiped him. But as his time in combat unfolded. He began taking larger and larger risks to make the most of every single opportunity he had to score. As as late 43 progressed, there were fewer and fewer opportunities because there were less Japanese airplanes left. And he recognized that. And so he kept violating his own tactical precepts to score a kill. And he was incredibly lucky in one fight. I think it was in December of 43. He violated all his basic tenants, slowed down in the middle of a fight to stay behind a target he was shooting up, and they got bounced from behind with uh, – they were on the deck over a, over a Japanese airfield at Wewak, and there was um, a superior force that had altitude coming down on them. Mm -hmm. uh, they were in P-47s. They don't accelerate very quickly. Uh, he was He was, you know – stuck because the only way to get out of a, a jam in a p-47 was to dive but he was at 200 feet oh. he tears across the airfield and these uh these japanese ki-61 uh hein which were late late model fighters brand new generation of japanese army air force fighters come tearing across the airfield after him and the japanese gunners misidentified them as P-40s and started shooting at their own planes. And they had to break off the attack. And that's what saved Neil that day. Um, wow. So so the race was really driven and supercharged by Neil and his his desire to catch up to Bong and, and, and everybody else. And then it, his goal was to hit 50. And, of course, he received the Medal of Honor uh, for a fight in which he, he shot um, – oh, my gosh, I can't remember if it was six or seven down uh, or claimed six or seven – uh, in reality, there were two that went down, but you know, wartime claims were always inflated on both sides. So, mm -hmm. um, anyway, that was the biggest, the biggest shift in my perception of the ace race was that it was really, it, it got off the hook out of control with, uh, with Neil's ambitions. Mm -hmm. 
And now they were promised two cases, right? Eddie Reichenbacher threw in, he, he threw in one as well, right? He did, yeah. And when Bong eventually broke the uh, the record, uh, there was a temperance society in the in the United States that just lost its mind. You can't be giving liquor to our men in combat. What are you thinking? You know, <laughs> these are fine, upstanding American boys. And Bong was was like, okay, whatever. Just give me a couple of cases of Coke. And uh, Bong didn't really drink anyway, so that was fine with him. So <laughs> he ended up getting two cases of Coke. That's funny. Um, was there a question that you found particularly difficult to come to a conclusion on, conclusion on, or, or, uh, maybe you never did answer it. Um, and you still wonder about it. Charles McDonald is, um, it's still an enigma to me, but he was an enigma to pretty much everybody who ever knew him. Perry Dahl was his, uh, best friend, PJ. He's the last surviving 475th fighter group ace. Um, he provided me all the information uh, he had and, and memories that he had of Charles. And there are these really, really touching moments that, that PJ told me about that really made me want to know more about him. And one of those was um, the, the guys, when they went on leave down in Australia, they just blew off steam. I mean, this was, these were really hard parties. You know, the scene at the beginning of Das Boat where everybody's just, you know, all those German yeah, yeah. sailors are, are yeah, okay. Yeah, <laughs> that's the kind of scene, day one and day two after they get back from New Guinea, that's what the Buckingham, which was a um, an apartment complex that the Fifth Air Force rented, would look like. And McDonald was down there with his pilots, and PJ was there in the in the flat, and everybody was partying and drinking heavily, and, and Mac was just nursing a drink. He wasn't, you know, pounding shots or doing anything like that. He was like, you know, 27 or 28 at this point. He was kind of beyond the, the, the pilot party scene and he looked really uncomfortable. And then one of the other guys from the squadron brought him two women who he tried to sit down on Max laps. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, uh, a lot of these guys were married. And let's be real, they didn't think they were going to live mm -hmm. uh, very long. So the the vows of uh, faithfulness kind of went out the window. Um, and the same thing was going back on back home, too, let's be fair. Well, Mac waved these two girls off. And he stood up, completely uncomfortable, and walked away. And PJ went after him and said, hey, let's go get something to eat. And they went and got a steak dinner, and they talked, and he could see that you know, Charles McDonald's, you know, he was a family man mm -hmm. that all made him uncomfortable. He was devoted to his wife and to his children. And so he checked into a hotel and didn't go back to the to the flat the entire leave. Mm -hmm. And he and PJ went and did, you know, quite uh, honestly, wholesome, clean cut tourist sorts of things while they were down on leave in Sydney. Mm -hmm. And th that's a that's a striking difference. So I, I really wish I could have learned more about him. In fact, someday I'd like to really dive in and do a, a full uh, standalone biography of him because he was a remarkable combat leader, ultimately. And when when he um, left the service, he was a colonel for 20 years hmm. after the whole Charles Lindbergh incident. He never got promoted. They had a Charles uh, Charles McDonald Day for him at uh, McCord Air Force Base in the 60s as he retired. Big celebration for him because he was one of the last and highest scoring aces still in uniform from World War II hmm. with 27. And uh, his wife died shortly after retirement and he uh, got into his sailboat and vanished into the Caribbean for eight years. Nobody saw him. He just wandered around. He he eschewed interviews. The only thing he ever wrote was his experiences with Charles Lindbergh for Collier's Magazine uh, right after the war. He didn't write his memoirs. He didn't try to publish anything. When people tried to get him to talk at events, he wouldn't do it. And uh, he was just uh, the, the epitome of a quiet warrior and hmm. quiet professional. Interesting. So obviously a lot of the research, a lot of the book – has had an emotional impact on you, but which either positively or negatively was there? What, what do you think stands out for you? Like it, what was the most emotional bit of it for you? 
Wow. Um, <laughs> if you feel, you know, if you feel like, yeah, no, it. no worries. Um, that's a great question. I'm just sitting here trying not to cry actually. Uh, okay. So the Genesis of race goes back 30 years, but I had written a book about Gerald called jungle Ace, And that's, that's really kind of the dawn of my own writing career back in 96 <laughs> was to go do that. It ended up being my second book published. Um, but in 2010, I was in Afghanistan, and I was aboard a Chinook helicopter going to a, a, a remote outpost called Ajuristan in the Hindu Kush. And w our Chinook was filled with ammunition, mortar rounds, um, and like the entire center aisle was just stacked with, with uh, ammunition. And we had 40 Polish soldiers on board, light infantry, from Fab Ghazni. And as we were heading up to Ajuristan, we suffered mechanical failure and had to t had to make a forced landing on a um, the only flat stretch of ground for miles in any direction. It was a it was a tri lake bed. Mm. We were super lucky. I get out the you know the the poles set up a cordon and then every single aircraft in the area is is directed to us. Mm -hmm. We were surrounded by the Taliban. They never attacked us. And I didn't even know we were surrounded until about three years after we got home mm -hmm. when the pilot let me know. Um, and, uh, and while I was on the ground, I, I came up with a bucket list of items that I wanted to do. And I really wanted to go back and, and revisit, um, the Fifth Air Force with two books. The first was indestructible, became indestructible. And the second was going back and looking at the ace race again and writing about Gerald and Wally Jordan and Tommy McGuire and, um, you know, Richard Bong, uh, McDonald and, and Kirby and Lynch, um, within the context of my own experience and growth as a human being who had now gone from, you know, uh, very privileged, graduate student at the University of Oregon to somebody who'd actually seen combat, who had lost people in combat, who'd lost people very, very close to me. So the, the meaning and, and the, um, the nature of the fighting changed as I went back and looked at it again, because I, I had a completely different lens. You know, when I wrote Gerald's original story, I was a 24 year old kid of Namor just thought, you know, the planes are cool. All this is cool. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. Now I came at it from a totally different viewpoint, uh, having experienced combat myself and, and the losses. So, uh, when I had to write Gerald's ultimate fate, it's like the, the great kick in the groin to a historian is you always know where things looking back as you're writing these stories, you always know where things went wrong. And there's nothing you can do about it. Mm -hmm. And you can trace the destruction of, of these families whose pilots were lost in, in this race or afterwards. Uh, you can trace how their families suffered for decades to come after that. They were never the same again. So that was the hardest part for me to write and, and the most emotional because I, I'm not a gold star dad. I had a kid who was very close to me, who was, um, I was his mentor, who was killed in Iraq in 09. Mm. So as I, um, as I wrote that section and started learning what happened to these families after their pilots went down, it's dreadful. It's dreadful. Neil Kirby's uh, wife became an alcoholic. The whole family was wiped out by, uh, Neil's generation was wiped out during World War II because his only brother was killed in August of 43 in a plane crash, Neil's, uh, three sons all died in plane crashes. Uh, when, uh, his widow remarried, she remarried into very, um, uh, horrific circumstances. She ended up having, uh, domestic abuse issues and, uh, uh, issues isn't even putting the right term there. Um, but she ended up shooting two of her husbands in self-defense oh, wow. and, yeah, they went from upper middle class Texas uh, uh, family with political aspirations and politicians in the family to, you know, a family that was scattered and 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 uh, really really harmed uh, by all of the effects of of losing their national hero. You know, I mean, imagine imagine trying to remarry when your previous husband was one of the most famous pilots of his day, held the Medal of Honor. And is, you know, a national hero. Mm. 
How do you follow that as husband number two? That's right. not for the faint of heart. Yeah. Yeah, I think those are, all of what you mentioned are very important aspects of this story. You know, stories like these, um, that they're not, they don't occur in isolation, you know. Um, no, not at all. When, when you go to war, when, when the president says, yes, send the troops in, they're not just sending the troops. He's not sending, you know, just a private, private Joe there. Mm -hmm. He's sending private Joe's mom and dad and husband and, you know, Josephine, uh, husband and wife, uh, the kids, the, you know, the grandkids in certain circumstances. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, they're all, all the military families are all thrown into that fire. And when they lose their soldier, when they lose their, uh, aviator, it is a catastrophic series of cascading events that that oftentimes the families never recover from. Yeah, I mean the 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 soldier or sailor, airman or marine doesn't even have to be injured or killed. Just the the absence and and the things they come back with, you know. That is very true. Also, absolutely. Yeah. So um, I actually just had to deal with that last night. A very close friend of mine who served in Iraq in uh, OIF two just tried to commit suicide. Mm. So it's and another one who was in the same battalion drank himself to death. Unfortunately, he was a very close friend of mine. Um, the end of September and I spent a week in the hospital watching him slip away. So it's uh, uh, it's a very raw subject for me. So I, 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 I do think it's important that we talk about it because there are times where we have to fight. But we got to be very, very careful and make sure that the cause and our leaders are worthy of the cost that is going to be incurred by the people who are actually shouldering the burden of the war. Yeah, I agree. And um, it's good to hear that your book, this book, does have that that feeling, that, how should I put it, that uh, attitude in it. So, yeah. Thank you, Chris. Like, you know, yeah. all too often I see, like, people think of these air battles as uh, as video games. And I was guilty because, like... Back in the 90s, I was a historian for a computer game company that was making flight simulators. We made Aces of the Pacific, um, Dynamics Incorporated's most successful um, uh, flight sim. And uh, uh, and so I had some of that m mindset, too. And, and talking to the guys uh, who were there knocked some of it out of me. And then uh, embedding and going overseas knocked all of it out of me. It's like the... I kind of went through the same process that Gerald went through when he was in the Aleutians. You know, once once he realized the stark nature of combat, he grew up, and so did I. But it took me a lot longer than than he did. What do you hope the book will do uh, for readers? I hope it brings it home that these men were men. They they aren't these cardboard cutout heroes that have been portrayed. I'm mean, like guys like like Richard Bong and Neil Kirby, they were hero worshipped in the forties and that lingered deeply in the national consciousness. And how they were written about in the immediate aftermath of the war was very much in that vein also. And what I was trying to do with race is fill them out as human beings and show them as who they were, which were kids who believed in the cause, who believed in their country, who had grown up in small town uh, Oregon and small town Wisconsin, uh, who had joined the military voluntarily because they felt like uh, they had a duty to protect the people at home. And they had strengths and weaknesses. They had flaws. Tommy McGuire was was roundly detested by pretty much everybody who flew with him. But in the air, nobody wanted anybody but Tommy leading them because he was such a phenomenal presence in, in the air, and he was utterly selfless. He almost got killed saving one of his own guys uh, against just ridiculous odds and, uh, and, and, and paid a very deep, heavy price for it. And ultimately, that's what killed him in 1945, was going to the rescue of another one of his pilots. So... I hope once a reader 
finishes the last word of the book. And I know that that's quite the mountain because it is, I think, 540 pages. I hope they walk away with a sense of appreciation that, that these these guys were American kids who were thrust into the worst possible situations and rose to the occasion. And I hope in some respects that is inspirational because it has been to me. Because I know that you know if, if our nation was ever threatened to the degree that it was in World War II, that those people, men and women, still exist. I've met them. I've helped train them with the uh, volunteer group I've run working with the uh, Oregon National Guard and Reserve, um, the, the Guards Infantry Units. I've, I've met those kids. They believe in this country. And I think that's, um, that's something that all of the millennial bashing that goes on uh, tends to um, discount. Uh, or or ignore. There is still a vein of patriotism in the country that's uh, uh, that's vital because that's the only way we're going to make it in the years ahead. Yeah. Is if people who believe in this country. So I hope I hope that that's the things that people carry through mm -hmm. after they finish. Yeah, yeah. People shouldn't be scared of the length. It's a pretty smooth read. Um, yeah, it's not daunt. It shouldn't be daunting for anyone. Um, Thank you. the font's big too. <laughs> <laughs> Um, did you have any difficulties getting the book uh, finished or published? Oh my God. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Chris, God, you, you asked these awesome questions. Oh my God. <laughs> so, all right. So I, I finished up the last of the research trips and that was the cross country one. I got home in, in late September of 2017 and I immediately went up into the woods to write. There's a little cabin in the woods in the in the Oregon Cascades above Detroit Lake that is four miles from the nearest human being in the wintertime that I use to focus and, you know, um, and, and write. It's it's where I go when I just need to buckle down and, and, and get a book written. And I was up there on and off for six months working on Indestructible back in 2015. So I went back up there. I was writing away. And my son and five other kids from the high school fell seriously ill with um, uh, an affliction that turned out to be a viral infection that left them uh, shaking severely and uh, ultimately made it impossible for my son to stand or walk. Mm -hmm. So I put, put everything on hold trying to figure out what this was, going to do experts, going up to OHSU. Went and saw the building that Gerald flew between after he proposed to Barbara, by the way. And um, for five months, I was I was carrying my son Ed to the to the bathroom, and it was uh, the hardest, most trying time in my life, without a doubt. And I didn't know if my son was ever going to be able to walk again. And here I was stuck. Um, I didn't have the time or the energy. I couldn't go anywhere to write. I, everything was, was going towards making sure Ed was getting the best care possible. And so for five months, while I was supposed to be writing the book, I put that on hold to take care of, of, uh, of Ed. And ultimately he came through it with flying colors and we found out what it was and got him treated. But I'll tell you what, um, there were a lot of doctors who not only didn't know what it was, uh, they thought the answer was just to drug him up with muscle relaxants and just crazy amounts of medication that mm. that served no purpose. So that was a constant battle. So once it did uh, stabilize and Ed got back to school for the last month and a half of his junior year, uh, I went up to write in the woods and then was asked to step in and help uh, finish a book called Top Gun with Dan Pedersen. So I ended up stopping work on race and doing that. So as I picked that back up after the 60 day marathon in the summer of 2018 to, uh, uh to get, uh, Top Gun delivered with Dan, mm -hmm. I went back into the woods and immediately contracted pneumonia. <laughs> oh, man. So, uh, that put me down and eventually I was able to finish it in December of 2018, which is why it's taken so long to get the second book after Indestructible uh, finished up. But uh, uh, I didn't want to rush it. I wanted to make sure that everything that I wrote in there was accurate because I know a lot of people uh, hero worship these guys. And I knew if I wrote anything that could be construed as negative, I better have all my ducks in a row. So, um, 
that was uh, uh, that yeah, that was that was the story of getting that book uh, uh, onto the page. It was tough. Yeah. Did the other kids do okay? Also. Yeah, everybody uh, emerged with flying colors. It, it was um, it's a very strange. What, what happened? Ed was the third case, but he was the worst. Uh, the 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 uh, heaviestly impact the most heavily impacted. And what made it worse was right in the middle of it all, uh, his immune system was so compromised, he ended up with mono, and that took him down for another six weeks. So it was it was a battle. Hmm. Wow. Well, I'm glad everyone's good now. That's uh, pretty scary. Thank you. Yeah, the book is to, uh, dedicated to Ed, uh, in part because of that, but also because uh, he was, uh, his little presence when he was kind of like 10 no, it was nine. Uh, in my life, when I got home from Afghanistan, you know, we were talking about all the things that that um, you know guys coming home suffer from. I, I experienced some of it too, and I was having a terrible time. And what pulled me through that was Ed. So um, those two reasons are why the book are, are dedicated to my boy. Nice, awesome. Um, what's your next writing project? Well, <laughs> um, not I to am... put the pressure on, but. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure Hachette has cleared me to talk about it yet, but I will say this. Uh, one of the things that I really wanted to do after uh, doing all the research on Indestructible was revisit the Philippines. Hmm. And some aspect of the Philippines that I thought was um, absolutely fascinating was the story of these guys who decided not to surrender and went into the bush instead and became the... Um, the start of the, you know, the nexus of the American guerrilla campaign against the, uh, and Filipino uh, guerrilla campaign against the Japanese. Mm. And so the next book will take place in the Philippines and it will go back to, in some ways, my roots, the, the ground operations. Um, I've spent 12 years, 12 years being an insurgent for the Oregon National Guard. Uh, in training exercises, so uh, we're their op for, uh, and have been their op for, for, for uh, since 2008. And, uh, being able to utilize the things that we've learned doing that sort of, um, those sort of asymmetrical operations with the guard and, um, you know, contextualizing my experiences so I can further understand what the guys in, the Philippines were trying to do, I, I really, really, really interested me. Hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, that does sound interesting, but I don't want to get you in trouble and, and have you, <laughs> you know, thanks, Chris. Go into too many details. Um, where can people find your work and your thoughts? I assume the books, you know, the books are on Amazon and that sort of thing, but do you have a website or social media or anything? I do. Um, uh, you can find me on, on Facebook, John R. Bruning, but I, I will warn you, um, pretty much most of the things I post on Facebook are cat photos. <laughs> um, I have a cat that swims and hikes and climbs uh, uh, trees all over Oregon with me. We've hiked everywhere, and the cat drives in the car and sits on the dashboard, all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, so because there's so much contention on social media, I try to keep it light. Um, but you can find what I love writing about, which is the, uh, you know, the men and women that I've met over the years who have really impressed the heck out of me with their dedication and devotion to our country. Uh, the American warrior.com is where I'm, I, I write, and that is my website. You can also find it by going to John Bruning.com. That'll take you to, uh, my landing page in the American warrior.com. And Bruning spelled B R U N I N G. Yes. John G G. I'll, I'll spell the whole thing. J O H N B R U N I N G dot com. Yep. Okay. And you said that's the American Warrior dot com. Okay. All yeah. right. Um, yeah, I think if you go to AmericanWarrior.com, it's like a furniture company or something, but uh, I am the American Warrior dot com. Okay. Good. Good. That's important. So that's all the questions I have. Do you have any uh, final thoughts or words? I just want to thank you, Chris. I really appreciate the, the opportunity to talk about these five really phenomenal Americans. Um, it's just a great honor to be able to reintroduce these men to a country that in large measure is, has forgotten about these guys. So it's, it's uh, uh, greatly appreciated. Uh, and I, I thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for listening. 
You can find more podcasts like this on your favorite podcast feed under the title Military History Inside Out. That includes Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and Spotify. One great way to support me is to rate my podcasts, either good or bad. You can find more great military history information at warscholar.org, on YouTube at Warscholar, on Facebook at Warscholar, on Instagram at Chris Alvarez Warscholar, and on Twitter at Warscholar. Please support me by following me on those sites and liking my videos. If you like to read, don't forget to sign up for my weekly newsletter where I recommend newly published books. The subscription box is on my webpage. Thank you.